Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Carolina Conversation. I'm your host, Shimon Williams, and we have one of the Tar Heels great with us today. Um, he hails from Brentwood, New York. He attended the University of North Carolina. He started in 1972. He was a two-time uh, All-ACC player. He was 1976 ACC Player of the Year. He was also an NBA rookie first teamer, and he's a three-time national uh, well, world champion. But more importantly, if you walk into the, the North Carolina arena, his name hangs there in the, in the rafters. He's one of the greatest Tar Heels ever as a basketball player and also as an administrator. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the Mitch Kupchak. Thank you, Shabad. Um, you're a great player as well. And that was a heck of an introduction. I'm not well, sure, third, but I appreciate it. Well, the, the greatest thing about the introduction, Mitch, is you don't have to fabricate. It's already written. So that means you've already done the work. So, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of times because we come from the North Carolina environment, uh, uh, we don't we don't take the time to to, to look at some of the things that we've been able to do, but those are all the things that you did yourself. And so with that being said, kudos to you, man. Kudos to you. But more important, how are you doing? Well, I'm good. Um, I'm in Charlotte. I'm in my office. And okay. we're about 20 games left in the season. You know, we've been struggling just a little bit. And... Um, Today we're going to, or we just signed, you know, Isaiah Thomas to help us a little bit in the backcourt. Right. Um, we're in a playoff hunt, so it's a little bit exciting. You know, of course, March Madness is right around the corner. So right. that's exciting. And after 35 years in Los Angeles, you know, I've been here four years now, and I just love North Carolina. <laughs> well, I'll say this. Um... North Carolina and the Bobcat uh, organization is, is, is very lucky to have an individual like yourself. I mean, like you said before, you've been, you've been doing, you know, uh, you know, NBA administration for years. I mean, you've been, you've been executive of the year before. I mean, you were part of some of the, uh, the greatest dynasties in, 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 in world in the NBA basketball profession. Um, you know, you've, You've been the general manager that have gotten these great players and, and put them together and got them to play together and, and, and all those things. And so it's great to see the things that you're doing now with the, the Charlotte Hornets um, and being able to have an eye for talent and, uh, and making it exciting uh, for those who, who love the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, so with that being said, what made you go into administration? Well, Good question, right? Um, it ended up being one of the best things, you know, that ever happened to me. Uh, at the time, I didn't know how it was going to work out. I went to Los Angeles as a free agent and signed a long-term contract. And halfway through my first year, um, I went down in the game, you know, with a, you know, an ACL injury. Uh, mm -hmm. I also had some you know, additional damage like cartilage and I broke a bone. But, you know, at the time, the ACL injury, this is 1981, you know, was considered an injury that ended a lot of careers, right? Right. Um, you know, there, there were a couple of ways to repair it. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, which one of these directions to go because it was still experimental. Right. So I did have surgery. I ended up missing two years. Um, I was still getting paid. I was still under contract, but I knew I had to rehab. Uh, and I knew I was going to miss, you know, two years. You know, today mm -hmm. you get the injury, and you're back playing within six months. You know, <laughs> right. You didn't know you'd come back at all, uh, and if you did, you were going to be out a year or two. So, right. um, I was looking at the end of my career. You know, even though I was still on contract. I was living in Westwood, getting you know, rehab every day. And um, 
you know, the rehab was two hours a day, whatever, three hours a day. I had all this extra time. So, you know, you're forced to think about, you know, the what ifs. Right. You know, if I can't come back and play. You know, I've got a lot of free time. So I started taking some classes at UCLA's business school. <clears throat> and then the second year I actually enrolled in the school, you know, still not knowing if I was going to be able to come back and play or not. So long story short, um, I did continue with the degree at UCLA mm -hmm. and um, I did get back to play on a limited basis with the big old knee brace, which, you know, you don't see very often today, mm -hmm. but the injury forced me to think about, you know, my life after basketball. And um, after three years of still playing, you know, I injured the same knee again. And the general manager at the time, Jerry West, you know, who I became close with, mm -hmm. you know, came to me one day and said, you know, Mitch, you, you don't have to continue to do this. Um, I could use some help in the front office. And back then there was nobody in the front office. There was you know, maybe an administrative assistant and the GM. Right. Uh, and the NBA was beginning to explode. So, you know, I looked at it, you know, as a great opportunity. You know, I really didn't think I could continue to play. Um, so I jumped at the opportunity and, uh, I moved in to work with Jerry West, you know, the all time best GM ever. Um, and at the same time, I ended up finishing, you know, that degree at UCLA. So, um, I kid sometimes, you know, as to, you know, why Jerry asked me to come in and work with him, right? Right. Me, you know, Hey, you know, Mitch is going to school and. You know, you know, he must be a hard worker. And but part of me says he wanted the roster spot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he work with him. But that's, that's kind of how it played out. Right, right, right. Well, uh, a lot of people and a lot of uh, and, and most definitely that Los Angeles franchise was very, very lucky to, that Jerry uh, chose you to do those things, because not only, you know, were you a participant there, um, you know, with some of those great teams, but you also like were the GM to help lead some of those great teams in the future. And, and, and so, um, you know, the one thing that I've always appreciated about you is um, beyond, you know, the, the, the stigma of being the Los Angeles Lakers GM and Mitch Kutchett from that, from, from that era, you, you were always um, uh, a very intricate part of the university of North Carolina uh, advancement in basketball. Um, Coach Smith would, you know, I remember before meeting you, uh, how Coach Smith used to talk about you um, and, you know, would run a lot of things by you. Um, and I think even in the 1993 NBA draft, uh, you chose a, a kid from Roanoke, Virginia, that played at the University of North Carolina after winning the national championship. I think at 12th pick, D. Uh, George Lynch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've always been an advocate of, of Carolina basketball and you've not only talked about it, but you lived it. And, uh, and, and so with that being said, Mitch, rolling back the, the hands of time, 1972, if I'm not mistaken, what made Mitch Kupchak leave New York to come to the University of North Carolina? Well, that's a good question, right? Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of games on TV you know, back then, and I wasn't that familiar with the ACC. And Coach Smith, you know, had some recent success, right? I think they went to the Final Four three years in a row. Um, and then the year before me, you know, they also went to the Final Four. And it's hard for me to say he was just beginning, but it was definitely in the first third of his career, right? Right. Uh, he, at that time, he was considered an up-and-coming, uh, coach you know, who had some success, but clearly, you know, 15 years later, you know, he was one of the all time best forever, right? Right. Um, at the time, St. John's, you know, was the local school, but Lou Carnesecca had left to go coach the Nets. Uh, so, you know, the new coach, you know, I think it was Frank Molzoff. Um, you know, he was good. He, you know, obviously Lou Carnesecca went on to be a, a Hall of Fame coach. Right. But I don't want to um, really 
stayed home. I wanted to get away a little bit. Right. You know, the other program in New York was Manhattan College with Digger Phelps. And he really got that program going. And then he right. went to Spain, right? Right. So um, back then, there were no limits on how many schools you can visit. And I had great guidance from my high school coach, Stan Kellner. Um, and with his guidance, you know, I ended up visiting, you know, at least four ACC schools. Uh, and then, you know, schools like Syracuse and Penn, uh, TCU, which was the first school that ever contacted me, you know, right? Um, mm -hmm. Notre Dame with, you know, Digger Phelps. So, you know, there were no limits. And I ended up visiting at least 10, maybe more schools. Right. And, you know, South Carolina, of course, you know, which was where Frank McGuire right. was. Mm -hmm. But I was most comfortable in North Carolina. You know, the players that I would play with uh, just made me feel at home. You know, the recruiting process, you know, I was with the, the kids or my teammates the whole time. And right. it wasn't just like the student manager or like maybe you know, one guy on the team would take me around for the weekend. You know, all the players were together and um, I just felt comfortable. And the last thing, you know, Coach Smith was so impressive. You know, my year was the first year that freshmen were allowed to play for varsity. Gotcha. You know, prior to that, you had to play JV basketball. JV. Right. Okay. So it was uncharted waters. And a lot of the coaches at the time, you know, were promising players, including myself. You know, if you come to my school, you know, you'll start and play X amount of minutes, right? So I would leave that office of that coach and then somebody else would walk in and I'm saying to myself, well, what, what is he promising that person? Right. With coach Smith, you know, I didn't get any promises. You know, he, he did promise my mom and dad that I'd go to church, right? Right. Uh, he did promise them that I'd graduate. Right. But all he promised me was, was a, a level playing field. And, and he would say things like, Mitch, I think you can play for us. You know, but I can't promise you that. Um, it depends on how hard you work. And, you know, the ball is going to be in your court. But I think you can play for us. But I'm not going to promise you, you know, that you're going to play or start for me. You know, that's going to be up to you. So to me, you know, you know that was kind of a good feeling, right? It was right. like, you know, level playing field. You know, if I'm good enough, I'll play. Right. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And so when you got down to the University of North Carolina after making your decision and having a great senior year, I mean, you were one of the best players in the country um, and choosing to go to the University of North Carolina. When you got down there, um, you know, how was that environment when you first got to campus? You know, you're leaving, you're leaving New York. I mean, where the, the environment is totally different than being down in the South. Um, how was that adjustment for you? Um, culturally, and then how was the adjustment for you um, athletically? Well, the, the guys on the team, you know, were from all over the country. You know, right. Mostly, if not all of them, you know, from east of the Mississippi. Right. You know, everywhere when Carolina would get a guy in those days from you know, the West Coast. Uh, so the guys on the team were from all over. Right. Um, and it was a close group. Um, they made me feel comfortable. Right. But I'd be lying if I didn't say, you know, growing up in New York and, and moving to the South in 1972, you know, wasn't um, a huge adjustment. Right. But, in, you know, I can make jokes about, you know, hey, the guy saying, let's go get a pizza. Right. Um, New York, there's a, a pizzeria on every corner, right? Right. Apple Hill, that meant going to Pizza Hut. Right. <laughs> they, they would put pineapple on the pizza, and I just, you know, I, I said, you kidding me, this is pizza. So, you know, stuff like that. But also, you know, um, the South at that time, right, what was starting to emerge, but it had not yet, you know, emerged uh, it was still very segregated. Right. Um, a lot of the things that, that I saw and experienced, even the university at the time, 
you know, was not fully integrated, right? Right. So it was, it was a, you know, outside of the basketball team, you know, which was very integrated, um, and the staff and the people that I was with day to day, it was a big adjustment, you know, for me, just culturally. Right. You know, to try to adjust, you know, to what I was seeing. You know, of course, everybody spoke different, right? But that's another right. thing to joke about. But, um, you know, I've never been around, you know, that kind of support for a program. Right. You know, going school to like a program like that. And then the talent, I, I always felt I could play, but the uptick in talent, you know, was challenging as well. The schoolwork, you know, was difficult. Right. You know, I thought I was a decent student in high school, but, you know, my first year in North Carolina, you know, was really a challenge. Quite right. frankly, really a challenge. And I remember finishing, you know, the first semester in mid-December, taking my last exam. And then there was one of those stone walls, you know, outside, you know, the building. I forget the right. name of the uh, And I remember just leaving the building and then just sitting on that stone wall for like 15 minutes, you know, saying to myself, I finished, I got it done. Right. So you know, I felt I was going to get, you know, whatever, C's and B minuses. You know, I knew I wasn't going to get A's, but but I just felt that I made it, okay, right. through that first semester. It was quite a challenge. Right. And so how was your freshman year? I mean, like you said before, this is the first time freshman, the NCAA allowed freshmen to have an opportunity to play. And here it is. It's your freshman year. So how was your freshman year at the University of North Carolina playing under Coach Smith? Well, like I said, it was the first year of freshman eligibility. Right. Um, you know, the program, the coaches really didn't know how to handle it. Like I told you earlier, I wasn't promised anything. Right. Um, you know, preseason, you know, everybody scrimmages right. And the coaches would stick their head out of the office and look down and, and watch the scrimmages, right? Right. So I think they had a feel for how I would mix in with the um, varsity. Right. But for the first two weeks, and back then we started on October 15th. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and for the first two weeks, what they said was, is, well, Mitch, you know, start with the JV. In other words, JV would practice from two to four and varsity four to six. So they said to me, do the JV practice from two to three, right? And then go in the locker room and study for an hour, mm -hmm. right? And then practice with the varsity from four to six. Right. So I would do an hour with the JV. I'd go in the locker room and there was no place to study. So I would take a, a chair and go into the shower area Right. In Woolen Jim Carmichael, right? Right. And I would try to study in the shower area. So, you know, this went on for about two weeks. And, and obviously, you know, for a young kid, you know, that much practice and that much time away from, you know, uh, school was overwhelming. Right. You know, it was just too much. So, and maybe they saw enough, right? And they said, okay, Mitch, you know, that part's over. From now on, you're with the varsity. Okay. Um, so now I'm playing with guys like George Carl and Bobby Jones and, you know, Daryl Elston, you know, John O'Donnell and um, Ray Height, Don Johnston, you know, um, and uh, they're all upperclassmen and I was the only freshman. Right. Um, so I ended up playing minutes. You know, I don't know what number it, you know, I started out slowly and of course I never started. I mean, back then a freshman would never start. <laughs> right. Um, I, I would guess on a 40 minute game, I probably played 17 to 18 minutes a game, which was much more than I expected. Mm. Much <sighs> more. And um, a big adjustment on the court, you know, with, you know, a big man learning to run the floor. You know, in high school, big men didn't really run the floor back then, right? They'd go up right. and down with the low block. Right. And, you know, but, you know, playing with Bobby Jones, you know, I learned quickly, 
number one that I could run. Right. Uh, but that in order to keep up with guys like him and, you know, not get crushed in practice, I had to run. Right. So that was a huge adjustment. You know, ended up being a great thing for me in my career, learning to run the floor. Uh, defensively, it was a big struggle. Mm -hmm. You know, getting out on the wing and, you know, denied defense, you know, being 6'10". We didn't do that in high school, right? Right. So there was a lot of um, adjustments that I had to make. Um, but I was good enough to get rebounds. You know, um, yeah, I knew how to block out. Um, I was, you know, proficient enough in the low post, you know, where I, I could score. Um, so I don't know what my numbers are, but I felt as if my freshman year was a good freshman year under considering the circumstances. No question. No question. No question. Before we move on, let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet River Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up for Bet Rivers yet, now is the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their rush pay instant approval, withdrawing your winnings is safer, it's more secure, and it's more reliable. Now that basketball season is tipping off, get in on the action at betrivers.com today or by downloading the BetRivers iOS app. You must be 21 years or older. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. And while I got you here, let's talk about the Field of 68 Media Network, where college basketball matters most all year round. This is a digital media and podcast network that we've been building over the course of the last year. We have shows hosted by some of your favorite players covering the program that they love the most. A.J. Guyton hosts the House of Hoosier. Eric Devendorf covers Syracuse on the scorer's table. Dan Dickow hosts the Gonzaga Bulldog broadcast. We have Florida's Patrick Young and Duke's Andre Dawkins and North Carolina's Shimon Williams and Michigan's Stu Douglas and Illinois' Deion Thomas. The list goes on and on and on. We have more than 30 shows right now. So hit the links below and check them all out. And while you're at it, Make sure that you go check out the Field of 12 Media Network, your home for college football. And so with the, there it is. You're more acclimated to the South. You've integrated yourself within the basketball program. Uh, well, you, you say varsity within the team. Um, and so you have your first year up under your belt. Now you're going into your sophomore year where, you know, you've 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 understood what's asked of you. Like you said before, you you've challenged yourself and you've been able to see that you could do more things than, you know, you've done in the past, you know, how was your sophomore year um, at the university of North Carolina? Yeah. Well, but during, you know, during the summer, um, I did not go to summer school that year. Um, I worked camps in North Carolina, you know, for right. a week I paid a hundred dollars, you know, you had to work five days, you know, at Bowie's Creek or, or Davidson, you know, and you got a hundred dollars, right? Yes. But that was a lot of money, right? So I did that for four weeks and I went back to New York and uh, played a lot of, you know, a lot of basketball, you know, lifting weights and, um, you know, working out. Uh, and I got a call to play for the World University Games. Right. If somebody got hurt and um, Norm Sloan was the coach. And we had a great team, David Thompson and um, uh, Tom Burleson and Wally Walker, Marvin Barnes, Maurice Lucas, you know, kind of stuff like that. Wow. Uh, and we ended up traveling in Europe, you know, in Eastern Bloc countries. And the games were actually in the Soviet Union at that time in Moscow, right? So right. it was a great experience, a great growth experience. And when I came back to Chapel Hill, you know, I really felt as if I had grown as a player. And I had really good confidence. Uh, I ended up starting probably half the year. Where mm -hmm. frankly, I lost my confidence a little bit. And um, I still grew as a player, but I didn't really take that big step. Um, and, you know, my years there, we always won between 20 and 25 games. Right. But in order to advance to the NC2A, you had to win the ACC tournament. Right. And if you didn't, you probably got an invite to the NIT. Right. So 
Uh, so my first uh, two years, we did not win the tournament and um, we went to the NIT, but I felt I got better as a player, but I didn't feel I took that big step. Right, right. It's interesting that you begin to talk about this, the, the NCAA tournament and how you made it uh, back when you were in college, because there's a, there's a, a documentary uh, going on now on the ACC network called the tournament where it documents and talks yes. about the ACC tournament uh, also produced by a Tar Heel as well. But uh, watching you and getting the chance to see you guys when you were in, you know, during your years at University of North Carolina was, was very informative uh, to me. And so to hear you talk about that right now um, kind of leads into, you know, uh, what most people begin to know uh, of your greatness as a basketball player going into your junior and your senior year. Um, not making the tournament your sophomore year, uh, the NCAA tournament your sophomore year, was there any different thought process for yourself going into that junior year and, um, that, that helped propel not only you as a basketball player, but that team as a basketball team? Well, at the end of my sophomore year, I, I tweaked my back and I, I developed a back problem. So in between my mm -hmm. sophomore and junior year, you know, I, I played a lot in uh, June and July. Um, but uh, August, and um, I was home and basically just doing back exercises, right? Gotcha. And then when I got to Chapel Hill, you know, I did scrimmage and play a lot. Um, I had my confidence back and I really had a statistically, I made that jump, right? Yes. So now Bobby Jones had left, right? So, you know, I didn't have, you know, the pressure of like, you know, trying to measure up to him. I just felt like I, you know, now was one of the players that they were going to depend on, right? Right. So I did make a jump, but uh, the big difference was, you know, Walter Davis was now in his second year there. Right. And we had an incoming freshman, you know, by the name of Phil Ford. Okay. And, and that just, you know, changed everything. You know, Walter was a great teammate, um, all around player, can really score. And Phil just made, you know, my life so, so much easier. You know, he just took a lot of pressure off of everybody and everybody knows, you know, if you're talking about the best players ever at a Chapel Hill, you, you know, you probably named two guys, right? Phil Ford and Michael Jordan. Right, right. Well, you know, that year, as your junior year, you were named, uh, you know, first team, all ACC. Um, and so it, it showed that you, you know, you had an impact on that team and uh, your play helped propelled that basketball team. Um, and so uh, were you guys able to make the NCAA tournament that year, your junior we year? Did. Yeah, we struggled a little bit during the regular season. And at that time, Maryland and NC State, you know, they, they were, you know, we always tied for second. Uh, we didn't come in first, but we went no lower than second. But right. State and Maryland, you know, they just had great, great teams. Right. Uh, so at the end of my junior year, we did have the ACC tournament in Greensboro. Right. And we came together at the right time. Mm -hmm. You know, and we played three games in three nights. I, I don't think we won a game by more than three or four points. Every game was either in overtime or came down to the last 10 seconds. Uh, and we won the tournament. Okay, which was very unexpected. Um, we had um, a first round game against New Mexico State. Mm -hmm. And then we were in the Sweet 16 and we went up to Providence and we got beat by a good Syracuse team. And then back then you, there was a consolation game. So we ended up playing against, I think it was Boston College. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a very unexpected ending, you know, to my junior year, but we were set up, you know, with Phil and Walter and Tom Lagarde and John Keister, incoming W. Bradley, 
you know, my, my teammates, Bill Chambers mm -hmm. uh, and Dave Hanners, uh, who were incoming freshmen with me. You know, now we're going into our, uh, my senior year. David Thompson had graduated, Tom McMillan, Len Elmore, you know, they were gone. So now the focus was clearly on, you know, my senior year at North Carolina that, that we were set up to have a great season. Yeah. And so let's talk about that senior year. That senior year, uh, you, were, you were named ACC Player of the Year. Um, so could you elaborate on, you know, your uh, superiority um, within the team? Because it's always a team. Um, but um, also talk about, you know, the, 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 the elevation of the team. Like you said, you were set up to do some great things. And so, you know, every, every great team has to have a great leader. And so with that being said, you know, how was, how was your senior year at the University of North Carolina? Well, in some ways, you know, knowing Coach Smith and his system, right, you know, as a senior, I was probably viewed as, as the senior leader. Right. You know, and I did feel as if, you know, I did have that responsibility. But the reality is the leader of the team was Phil Ford. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody looked to him. You know, he always produced. He was a great teammate. You know, a great, a great athlete. You know, he would joke that he couldn't jump very, very well. And, and he really couldn't, right? Right. But, um, but his, you know, lateral quickness, his, um, you know, straight ahead, speeding quickness, you know, his savvy for the game, um, you know, all eyes were always on him. And I would say if there was a real leader of that team, it was Phil Ford, right? Right. Uh, uh, Walter Davis, this was now his third year. Uh, Tom McGard. Uh, was now in his third year, you know, he is, he had emerged, you know, as a starter. So, you know, I was, I believe the 13th pick in the draft. Um, Tom Regard was the top 10 pick in the draft. Walter Davis, I think was three or four. Um, Phil Ford was, I think two, maybe. Mm -hmm. and Easter got drafted in the second round, right? And then Dudley Bradley, who came off the bench, was a first round pick. So that's a lot of talent. Yes, it is. <laughs> you, know, you know, nobody was allowed, as you know, you know, to be a ball hog. Right. Uh, not play team basketball, right? Right. You know, so my senior year, you know, my scoring average, you know, took a dip. Mm -hmm. you know, now we had these guys that I'm playing with. And quite frankly, you know, there's only so many – opportunities to score to go around right right so everybody made that kind of sacrifice but clearly Lagarde and Walter Davis and Phil Ford you know they were emerging right uh, going into the AC tournament ACC tournament I think we were 25 and 2 and that's the first year they moved the tournament out of North Carolina they moved mm -hmm. it to the Capitol Center up in Washington DC mm -hmm. And we got a buy in the first round. Um, and then in the finals, you know, we ran up against the team, Virginia. And I just watched it, you know, by chance two nights ago on the ACC tournament. Right. I was just flipping through channels and there it was, right? So I watched it and Virginia beat us in the finals. But they had changed the rule and now the NC took a NC two a took at large bids as well. Mm -hmm. So if you won the tournament, you were automatically in. But with the record of twenty five and three, you know we did get in that large bid. Right. Uh, so we went to Dayton and played Alabama, and um, I had my worst game as a college player, no doubt. And Phil Ford. You know, we were given two or three days off. Phil went back to Rocky Mountain, played a pickup game, and uh, sprained his elbow. So, you know, Phil really couldn't play, couldn't handle the ball with his right hand. And I had my worst game ever, and we got beat. So it was a very disappointing ending, you know, to my senior year. You know, I just felt that we were 
we were always ranked one, two, or three the whole year. And I thought we had a chance, right? But we didn't. And Indiana ended up going undefeated and they won the championship that year. Right, right. Well, you know, so, sometimes we aren't able to, to, to ascend to the levels that we think that we can in those situations because, you know, there's a lot of variables, especially in collegiate basketball. Right. Um, it's not like the NBA where you're going to get uh, a series. You know, you have a series, you're going to get the best team. Uh, when you're in the NCAA, you know, it's just one game. And, and unfortunately, if, if that team is, is that team that night, they win. And so um, I think that's what people appreciate about the NCAA as well, having the opportunity to, to do something that may, you know, may not never happen uh, again. Um, but with that being said, Mitch, I mean, you had, you had a great uh, four years at the University of North Carolina, like I said before, being first team, uh, all ACC, 75 and 76, and been the ACC player of the year in 1976. Um, then leaving the University of North Carolina and, and being the, the 13th pick in the NBA draft and, and playing numerous years in the NBA, um, you know, winning world championships, uh, being, you know, all rookie as an NBA player. But then we talked about at the beginning of the episode, you becoming an executive, uh, being in administration and, and, and being a part of, of seven world championships. <laughs> so, you know, you've, you've done a lot of great things within the game of basketball. You've been very integral in a lot of people's development. You've been very integral, intricate in, 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 in one of the most prestigious, if not the prestigious, um, uh, franchises in NBA basketball. Um, shoot, even you signed me in 2005, coming back from Barcelona. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't know if I was going to come back to the NBA because um, I like Europe. But um, if anybody's going to sell me to come back, it was you. Um, I, I, I wish that I could have spent more time with you. I just, you know, to be honest, I wasn't a fan of Phil Jackson. <laughs> so, so it did, it did, it didn't work out. <laughs> but with all that being said, and all those great things, and all those things you've been able to do within the game of basketball, this is the question that I would like to ask you. And it's usually my toughest question. When it's all said and done, and people you know, they look at Mitch Kupchak and they come into the arena and they look up and they see that number up in the rafters and they go to the museum and they see your name and they see your face and those types of things. And, and they see you don in that University of North Carolina in Jersey. What do you want people to know and to say about University of North Carolina's Mitch Kupchak? Well, that's probably one of the more difficult questions you know I've been asked, right? Um, tough to answer a question like that. I can't tell you how proud I am to be a part of a program. You know, when we started this, you know, Coach Smith was you know eight or nine years into his career, and he was an up and coming, you know, great coach. Um, who had yet to win a championship. And then like 10, 15 years later, you know, he was a legend, right? So, you know, I didn't know that at the time. I had great advice from my high school coach and I'm so glad I listened to him. But to be a part of, you know, this program like you are, right? Um, to go back there and, you know, to always feel welcomed. You know, I don't know really how to answer the question. Um, I, I think just, just the fact that I was a part of it and, you know, when I go back, I feel welcomed. You know, of course, I see people that have been there for many, many years. And of course, the longer you live, the you know, the less and less people, you know, that are going to be there. Um, but I've been lucky to be close 
when Coach Smith left with you know, Matt Doherty and then Roy Williams and then now Hubert. You know, Hubert Sr. was in Washington, D.C. when I played there um, because he was Walter Davis's brother. Right. Played in Washington, D.C. Hubert Sr. would invite me to their apartment and, you know, his, his wife uh, would cook dinner and I would hang out with Hubert Jr. and his, daughter, his sister, Keisha. So they were like, what, five, six years old. Mm -hmm. So now, what, 45 years later, you know, Hubert Davis is the coach in North Carolina. So, you know, how lucky is that, right? To be a part of, of every coach that has coached in North Carolina. And Frank McGuire recruited me at North Carolina. I mean, excuse me, South Carolina. Right. Yeah, you know, he was bringing down all the kids from New York. So I just feel, you know, I'm not sure I feel worthy or um, like I earned being a part of something like this. I mean, you may have those same feelings, right? Like we look at the Michael Jordans and the Phil Fords and you know, you kind of say, wow, th those guys made the program and um, the program is so big and successful. You know, sometimes I don't feel as if I'm deserving, right? Right. Uh, and I just look at it that, that I'm lucky, right? And in a lot of ways, you know, ending up there you know, I didn't know what I was doing as an 18 year old. Right. How did I end up there? You grown up here, you know, the University of North Carolina is a part of your life from the first right. time you TV. You know, growing up in New York, first of all, there wasn't that many games on TV. And you know, it, it was just a school in the South. So how did I end up there? Right. I mean, so. I guess that's a, a long-winded way of trying to answer your question, and no. I don't know if you did it justice. No, I, th I think you did it a lot of justice. Um, I thought I thought, you know, what you were saying was was quite interesting as well, um, because a lot of times, you know, I, I said this earlier. A lot of times, you know, when I began to talk about you and your successes, and you was like, "Wow," you know, like you know, maybe I was exaggerating a little bit. And I, and I, I told you, I said, well, Mitch, the, the great thing about this is um, those are things that you've done. And so, um, you know, your humility is always shows and has always shown. Um, you know, the one thing that I appreciate about you, um, and, you know, I, I consider you to be one of the godfathers of, of our program. Um, like I said before, before ever meeting you, I just remember how Coach Smith would talk about you. And and everything was kind of like, I, I can't say it, it was ran through you, but it, it, it you gave Coach Smith a lot of um, information that he felt comfortable in the decision-making processes of whatever it may be. If it was a kid leaving early, if if... If, if a person was the type of individual that could possibly be an executive, um, you know, just, you know, it, 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 it was like, from my perspective as a student athlete at that time, it was, let me talk to Mitch and find out or see what his thought process was about it. And for me, that was just to hear that it, it said to me, oh, you know, you, you see your name, but really, who is this Mitch Kupchak? And, right. and, you know, the older I got um, and began to ingratiate myself with, you know, North Carolina basketball and the family, I began to see, like, why Coach Smith relied so much on you, um, relied so much on Larry Brown. Um, for me personally, uh, I think you two guys, for me, were the example, like, of what Coach Smith wanted from us uh, as former student athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And, and it wasn't talk for me. It wasn't talk. It was your actions. Um, you know, I hold you and I hold Larry Brown in high regard. I always tell people, for me, those are the godfathers. Those are the pillars of Carolina basketball um, from my standpoint, um, especially the relationship I had with Coach Smith and, you know, the things that he would ask us to do, you know, come back, you know, be a part of the, the, the following, pro, you know, the guys that are coming through and stuff like that. I mean, shoot, myself, I built my house in Chapel Hill the year I got drafted because Coach Smith said, be back for these kids, you know, for the following players. So, you know, mm -hmm. I took everything that he said to heart, uh, maybe a little bit more literal than most. And so, you know, for myself, I always watched you guys. I watched you and I watched Coach Brown. And I just, you know, I always said, hey, these guys are living. You know, it's, it's one thing to talk it, Mitch, but it's another thing to live. It. And, uh, you know, maybe if I was younger at 32, 31, I may not say these things, but, you know, I'm close to 50 now. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm more mature. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm confident in the things that I say, but, um, you know, I want to say thank you because you have been a great example um, for myself and for others that are willing to watch and to, to investigate what this thing is really about. And you guys, you two have been a great extension of Coach Smith. And, um, you know, it, it allows me to try to do my part and strive to put myself in a position to continue doing the things that you guys are doing. I don't want to be a person that talks it. I want to be a person that walks it. And, uh, you know, it's great to, to see that. And uh, for me, I most definitely have to say thank you for the example that you are. And uh, it means a lot. It, it, it means a lot. So, um, you know, we just uh, we here at the Carolina Conversation want to say thank you for being a participant, man. Um, you know, you're extremely busy with the schedule. You know, you're you're moving and shaking. You're doing a great job there in in, in Charlotte. Um, really like to pick in Lomelo Ball, <laughs> and uh, you, you're bringing excitement and you're bringing that championship caliber back to the state of North Carolina. And uh, I want to say thank you, thank you so much. Jamar, thank you. Very, you you humble me and I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And so for those that are, are listening to the Carolina Conversation, we want to once again uh, give the great Mitch Kupchak another hand for being a participant today. Thank you, Mitch. And, uh, and when you're not watching the UNC Tar Heels play, uh, make sure you tune in to the Old Dominion women's basketball team led by uh, Hall of Fame um, nominee, Delisha Milton-Jones, who will be going into the Women's Hall of Fame here in the class of 2022. Right now, the team is 22 and six, uh, with two more games left uh, until the conference tournament in Frisco, te Texas. But uh, we wanna thank Mitch again for participating, and we wanna thank you for listening. Everyone have a great day.